Well, you've just seen the film Freedom Downtime. Uh, at least I hope you've seen the film Freedom Downtime. If not, watch this part later. See the film first because this won't make much sense to you or, you know, there might be parts that are confusing. Um, we're here with Kevin Mitnick in the year 2003, a few days after his supervised release has come to an end. Kevin, first of all, congratulations. Hey, thanks a lot. Great. Do I get a handshake? You get a handshake. You, <laughs> get, right, you get a lot more than that. Um, I can't imagine what it was like uh, throughout the whole period of time, but let's focus on the last few days and then we'll move back to what it was like during this whole process. It all came to an end. Uh, we're taping this in January of 2003. Um, what were those last few days like? Was it... Uh, very well, before it ended, it was actually a very, uh, very nervous time because my, my last time before my supervised release expired, the government uh, issued a warrant without you know, apprising me of it about 30 days before my supervisor was to end. And I never knew about it until after I was off. And then once I found out you know, 30 days after it expired, then that's when I went underground. So I was always in this nervous time of whether or not I'm truly gonna be off you know, supervised release. Is it really gonna come to an end? Or is the government gonna wanna keep me under their thumb? And uh, even today, I'm, I'm off supervised release. I called the probation department to ensure that there were no surprises and it still feels, I feel kind of surreal like it doesn't, like it's, uh, I, like I figured I'd feel totally different but I, I really don't and it's kind of funny, I called, a, I have, I'm on a good rapport with my ex probation officer, he retired around Halloween and I called him today saying hey I got off probation and he knew and he congratulated me but he warned me, he says be careful of Ken McGuire who was the FBI agent that was you know, the case agent in this case because, you know, he's going to still be looking into you. You know, they, they, they're still interested in you. In other words, they're not going to let, they're not going to ever let up on me and to be careful. When you say you're ex-probation officer, you mean from a previous case or from this No, one? from this case. So who was your probation officer until... until well, what happened is my probation officer that supervised me for about two and a half years retired in Halloween of last year mm -hmm. and then I was appointed a new probation officer for a few months. The guy that, I was, that was the new appointee, not, that's not the, the, the gentleman that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the guy that okay. was kind of supervising me for two and a half years. The guy that actually, you know, uh, dealt with me from the day I was released for about two and a half years. Okay. So now... Uh, it's so which means that the government is never going to leave me alone. Right. Right. And as is the case with uh, most people, I think, that have been through what you've been through or, or something similar. Bernie, they're, yes. They're always going to be keeping an eye on these people and probably to a lot, a lot of us, too. They'll be keeping an eye on, on us and um, monitoring our movements and things like that. But now, the last few days, though, what happened to you back in 1992, was it? 93? 92, you mean, you mean when I left? You, your supervised release was about to come to an end. Well, I was, tar I was targeted by um, a man who went by the name of Eric Hines. His real name was Justin Tanner Peterson. And Peterson was a co-defendant of, of another hacker, Kevin Polson. And Peterson was actually more of, not a hacker, but more of a criminal. He was um, using credit card numbers, living, you know, and doing credit card, you know, fraud. And he, got, he was busted in Texas. And then in an effort to reduce his sentence, he became an informant in the hopes of getting completely out of the mess he got himself into or getting a reduced sentence. So the FBI actually had Peterson target me because this was about one year before my supervisor release was ending and the FBI in Los Angeles apparently had told him if he can get Kevin Mitnick, he'd have a real feather in his cap. In other words, if he got me, the big fish, that he would uh, pretty much be, you know, given a very lenient sentence. So this was back in 1992, we, the first time your supervised release was coming to an end. It was merely days before it was over. And that 30 point, days. They actually issued the warrant on November 6, 92, and expired on December 7th. And what ended up happening is I stayed in my, at my residence until the expiration date last time. And then two days later is when the U.S. Marshals came and Ken McGuire actually showed up. And my mom was actually, since I left, she was packing up some of the stuff that she could use because I pretty much uh, abandoned anything that I didn't need. And then about, uh, about, I don't know, 21 days, 30 days later, I found out that they had issued a warrant for my arrest. Then I was afraid that I was going to be the, the example because they had put me in solitary confinement uh, for about eight months under the... Um, under, uh, because of the fear that I could start a nuclear war by whistling into a payphone. Oh. So I was afraid. And so I, 
I, I made my best efforts at, you know, staying, you know, trying to evade, you know, the FBI. Why not stay and fight the charges? Oh, because I would have been fighting them from solitary confinement. And I didn't, and I figured because of the hyperbole, you know, uh, pretty much, uh, which I believe is attributable to one man, John Markoff of the New York Times, because of the hyperbole and sensationalism he created because he wanted to write the Kevin Mitnick book, um, I was afraid that the government, just as they did last time, was going to, that they were going to sensationalize my case and claim that I had done things that not, e not only did I not do, but that were really impossible and create this whole fear. And thank God it's not happening today because with this, you know, in this post 9-11 world with Al-Qaeda, they would have sure, surely made me into an Al-Qaeda terrorist mm -hmm. and uh, because they wanted to play it up. I was the, I, I pretty much, even though I did wrong and I deserved to be punished, that wasn't my argument, but the punishment didn't fit the crime. My civil, civil liberties were disregarded and I kind of won the scapegoat sweepstakes. Well, let's go back to um, the solitary confinement and John Markoff. Um, first of all, what was the period of time that you were in solitary? Why were you in solitary? And how do you feel Markov ties into that period of time? Uh, in 19, uh, the first time I was in solitary confinement was in 1988. Uh, December of 88, I was arrested for uh, hacking into Digital Equipment Corporation. And they, had a, they had their uh, worldwide easy net. And myself and another hacker friend at the time had gotten into their network to, and we made a copy of a uh, program that was an automated hacker utility because we wanted to see how it worked, how it actually was able to break into these systems and we also wanted to look at the VMS source code because we wanted to be able to find all the vulnerabilities. Well, what ended up happening is the guy I was doing this with basically ratted me out uh, because we had a falling out and then I was arrested on December 8th, 1988 and at that time, uh, the, my, my first appearance in court I was really looking forward to getting out of jail to be able to fight this case because I, I always assumed that I'd get bail. You know, this was a white collar case. It was a computer hacking case. It wasn't a murder, rape, robbery. And, and when I made my first appearance in court, uh, I sat down in court. Uh, the attorney that was appointed to my case, I met for with about five minutes. And uh, so I had, he had no preparation. And as soon as we go into court, the federal prosecutor says, Your Honor, not only do we have to detain Mr. Mitnick because he's a grave danger to the security of the United States of America, mm -hmm. but we have to ensure that we keep him away from the phone because if he gets access to a telephone while in custody, even to the prisoner's pay phones, that he can somehow start a nuclear war. Now they said this back in 1988. In and this is in 88. Why would they be so afraid of you all the way back then? I remember the press back then. I remember yes. them saying they coined the phrase dark side hacker. and it was Well, actually that was the... That was the result of one man, a guy named John Johnson of the LA Times, wrote this article called The Dark Side Hacker or The, um, uh, the, the, umbilical, the umbilical Cord to, the, the, to the His Soul or something. It was this like, you know, featured article about me that uh, also, uh, before John Markov spread the myth about hacking into NORAD and doing all these things I hadn't done and really made me into this uh, public enemy number one. And at that time, I had no dealings with Markov that, that didn't happen until after I was released on that, on that case. Mm -hmm. So John Johnson, the reporter from the LA Times, is he the one who coined the phrase dark side hacker? Is he the one that, that made Yeah, I believe so. Out? I believe he is the one, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is the one that uh, at first called me the dark side hacker. And then I believe that Katie Hafner and John Markoff actually somehow obtained a copy of this, I believe because he's a reporter, he found it on the wire and basically repeated a lot of the same myths that John Johnson told. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is um, why would this guy from the LA Times in 1988 make you into such a threat? What was it about your case What that sells papers? It's sensational stories. They're all, it's all about making the money, getting ratings, headlines. And um, what this reporter had done is he wanted to write a sensational story. So he basically took uh, the Kevin Mitnick case, labeled me this dark side hacker, had, had said things it, uh, just as John Markoff had done, that I hacked into NORAD, um, that uh, uh, I, I, I don't recall the article off the top of my head because it was been so, it's been so long, but he basically also uh, had said these things, but I think he said they were allegedly. 
uh, to the best of my knowledge. I'd have to go back and look at the article. But John Johnson is the first guy that started this whole uh, dark side hacker so type this, image. Could this have been anybody that this happened to? The dark side well, it could, be, it could be to anybody. I mean, if you got a newspaper journalist that wants to write a compelling story, um, and uh, they have they have the power to do that, especially if you're in jail and you can't really speak up uh, and defend yourself. And the reason you can't do that is your attorney, whenever you're arrested on any type of case, be it reckless driving or computer hacking, your attorney is going to tell you to keep your mouth shut. So you're never going to be able to rebut anything that any of these journalists said. You're not going to be able to interview because your attorney is very concerned that you might say something that could injure your chances of an acquittal later. Mm -hmm. And you usually wind up plea bargaining to something that you didn't do in the first place. Well, what, what was very interesting about the case, imagine this, they put me in solitary confinement because I was such a grave danger to the United States of America, right? And then eventually they want to make a plea agreement, which means not go to trial, but settle the case. And so they offered me the agreement. They said, well, if you sign this agreement and admit your guilt and accept one year in custody, and uh, um, I believe that was it, that once you sign that paper, we'll let you out of solitary confinement and we'll put you in the general population. That's part of the deal. So why if Kevin Mitnick was so dangerous before I signed that paper, <laughs> why after I sign that paper does that alleviate the threat? And see what it really amounts to is a lot of federal prosecutors, I think most of them, it's not about truth, justice in, America, in the American way. It's all about winning. It's all about winning the case. And what they'll do is they'll use anything at their disposal to use as a, an ace in the hole or leverage to get you to do what they want. And that's exactly what they did with me, is I signed that plea agreement to get out of solitary confinement because after eight months of sitting in that small room, uh, you know, you kind of go a little bit stir crazy. Tell us about that. Now, solitary confinement, eight months. Eight months. That's pretty much, uh, imagine going into your restroom, uh, your bathroom at, at your home, Imagine about an eight by 10 room. It doesn't have bars. It's not really a cell, but it's a metal door with a sliding thing for food. Uh, you're kind of like a caged up animal for, for eight months. And if you want to shower, you know, they let you shower like three times a week. What you have to do is you have to stick your hands through the slot. They handcuff you. You stick your legs. Uh, they, can, uh, they can put hand you know, leg irons on your legs. And then they let you out. They walk you five feet down into the shower. You put your arms through there. They take the handcuffs off. You put your legs through the holes. They take the leg irons off. So you're treated like an animal. You can't even walk five feet without being handcuffed when you're outside the cell. And you only get out for one hour, five days a week. And the Bureau of Prisons, it was interesting because John Lippman did some research uh, to find out because he thought it was, you know, absurd. The author of The Fugitive Game. In The Fugitive Game, correct. And according to the Bureau of Prisons, they have no record of me being in solitary. What you about the piece of, of paper like, you signed? Is there a record of that piece of paper? Well, it's a plea signed? agreement. Mm -hmm. You know, a plea agreement that I agreed to settle the case. And then, you know, after I settled the case, as one of the agree beneficial uh, or, the, or, or the, one of the points that would benefit me is I'd get released into the general population. Then I ended up going to Lompoc Federal Prison Camp for four months, mm -hmm. and then I was released. Well, I mean, that's the interesting thing, because when we talked to John Markoff in the film, he seemed to be unaware that you were even in solitary confinement, which I found to be amazing. I think he is aware of it. He has to be very careful, because his whole reputation's on the line here, and he, know, he knows in his heart he has done wrong. He's no, he knows in his heart that he didn't report the facts. And he knows in his heart what his real motive was, is to write the Kevin Mitnick book. I believe this to be true because John Lippman, who um, would have no reason to lie to me, told, told me he had met John Markoff for lunch in San Francisco, and he confided to John Lippman that he wanted to do the Kevin Mitnick book. And then he offered uh, John Lippman the opportunity to do an article in Playboy regarding me. And Markoff uses that as the, oh, I was never interested in Mitnick. I gave, I gave uh, John Lippmann the opportunity to write this article in Playboy. But the reason Markoff couldn't do it, there was apparently some sort of conflict of interest. So there was another reason. Other, it's not that he just didn't want to. There was a reason why he could not. Well, and and what, what basically happened is, uh, is imagine uh, one day picking up a paper like the New York Times and reading a story about yourself. That basically, and they use this, you know, very unbecoming picture, and on the, and you're on the front page above the fold, 
and, you're, and it's as fact that you had done things that not only you did not do, but never have occurred. You know, like I was accused of computer hacking related stuff. What happens if some average guy on the street is accused of being a child molester mm -hmm. or something like that? Can you imagine the irreparable harm that a journalist, an, an unethical journalist can cause? And see, Markov, when he first wrote his article that in, ended up uh, being print, uh, the story ran on Independence Day of 1994, at that time I was a fugitive. And a fugitive in the sense that I was e evading arrest on this arrest warrant that I found out about later, about the supervised release. Well, John Markov knew that I wasn't going to come and rebut his article because I'd have to turn myself in. And he, he was banking on the fact that I wouldn't turn myself in to rebut it. And so I was kind of, you know, defenseless. I couldn't sit there and, you know, and sue him for libel or sue the New York Times. But Markov wrote the article true, but he didn't put it on the front page. No, somebody at the New York Times did. It didn't matter where it was. What, what mattered well, being is... Being on the front page does make a big difference, especially above yeah. the fold and, uh, you know, everybody yeah, well, can see your picture. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what influenced John Markov had at the uh, New York Times, but it did end up on the front page. I don't know if he's part of that decision-making process or not, but all I do know is the man intentionally wrote lies and libeled me with the intention of raising public interest, in my case, maybe influencing the Department of Justice to make an example out of me so he could write a book about it. And two books were written. Uh, Cyberpunk came out in... Uh... Well, Cyberpunk was before that. That was after my first case and how um, and it kind of a lot of the stories in the first chapter of the, you know, I, I, in case the people uh, watching this uh, don't know, I, I, I wrote, I co-wrote a, a book called The Art of Deception, which is about social engineering tactics and how to you prevent just read that book in the last year. Yes, it was released on October fourth of two thousand two. Okay, and in my first, in, in the first chapter was kind of like a general overview of Kevin's story because I wanted to get the facts out about a little bit of what, I, what, what happened in my case. And a lot of it was about my, a little bit of my background, a lot about how this uh, myth of Kevin Mitnick was created in the man that I hold responsible. Actually, too, it's really John, jo John Markoff and John Johnson. So what happened is the publisher loved the idea of having, you know, because everyone wants to know Kevin's side of the story. So the publisher or the editor uh, senior editor that I was dealing with was very interested and thought it was a great thing to have this story that would segue into the book, which is really about social engineering. And at the last moment, uh, before they're going to print, I get a call from John Wiley and Sons telling me that they're not going to include that chapter. Well, first of all, they called me saying they wanted to rewrite the chapter and take a, and, and, and edit it. So they sent me an edited piece and it didn't reflect my voice at all. Nothing, all the atrocious things that had happened to me and the injustices uh, were basically removed from the chapter. I said, no way. I said, if it's either all or nothing. So what they did is, what they did is despite my request, they just went, went with, they basically edited uh, my first chapter and called the pre and they labeled it the preface and didn't include, you know, really what I wanted to express. What happened is they, they were John Wiley and Sons released about three to four hundred galley copies of the book, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to their um, to their book buyers, to the media, you know, in part, as part of their publicity campaign. And what hand, what ended up is they actually had in that first uh, galley the, the the first chapter. And what happened recently, I was I was contacted by you, as a matter of fact, because you got an email that it somehow ended up in, on Yahoo somewhere. Mm -hmm. And now, fortunately, my voice or my my side of the story has pretty much been published, but only in certain you know areas on the uh, on the World Wide Web. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of reaction did you get when this when the story did break? Well, um, I don't know if the average person on the street that is aware of my case actually read it, but for the people that did, which is a lot of a lot of been you know fans and supporters and people that have been following this case, it was a very positive response, mm -hmm. and I'm glad that it got out. I couldn't have any part of it, you know, because I wrote right. that work for Wiley, but I'm actually glad that the word got out. I'm kind of, I'm very disappointed that it couldn't have ended up in the actual book itself because it was important for me to express my side of the story and it was very general though. That's where I got detailed. my first look at it was on the internet and uh, by, by seeing 
what you had to say. I admit it didn't really fit in with the rest of the book in, in the way that you telling stories about social engineering and how to protect your company, but I think it was very important to hear what you had to say. And yeah, I can understand why certain people would be very upset seeing you accusing them of things, but for God's sake, for the last eight years, you know, you've been prevented from speaking, from doing lots of things. And uh, obviously you have a side. In fact, to this day, you're still not really allowed to tell your story. Is that right? Well, I'm allowed to tell it. I just can't profit from it. As a part of, a, as part of the agreement I had to sign to get out of jail or to have, have, have to go through a trial, then the government, um, it's, that's a whole other story. I was basically told if I, take the, if I make the government prove their case, what they're going to do is take me to another federal jurisdiction and indict me and put me through a revolving door of trials so I'm ended up you know, spending time in custody for as long as they want, or I sign the agreement. And as part of that agreement, I had to sign, assign what they call an assignment agreement for a period of seven years after I'm off probation or supervised release, basically saying I can't profit off telling, you know, writing an autobiography, doing a newspaper article, magazine article, motion picture, movie of the week, or any commercial venture involving the Kevin Mitnick story. So basically what the government's doing is they're chilling my free speech by disadvantaging me from being able to profit of the time and energy it would take to get this out into a book or into a movie format. Now, I remember back in uh, 1995, I believe it was David Schindler uh, who said what, what you said here that he would take you to virtually every jurisdiction and charge you for the rest of your life. Exactly. And was that part of that particular threat that if you didn't uh, agree to this particular thing? Well, I'd agreed to the whole thing and this was part of the package. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, I agreed to this assignment agreement. Kevin Polson had a, actually they wanted it for life, but I negotiated it down to seven years, uh, which actually ended up being 10 because it was after my supervised release expires is when the seven year timer starts. Mm -hmm. Kevin Polson can't do it for life. And what their argument is, well, we can't have criminals profiting from their crime. But I, I don't look at it like that because I think our United States Constitution, what's the First Amendment? Freedom of assembly, freedom of press, freedom of speech. The First Amendment should trump everything else. And uh, what they're doing is they're weighing a public policy. They don't want people that have committed a crime to somehow profit indirectly from that. But any time the government disadvantages anyone physically or economically, uh, not exercising that freedom of speech, they're actually chilling that person's free speech, and I believe it's unconstitutional. So I am actually going to try to find an attorney to examine these issues. I'd like to go to the EFF, but they've never been any help to me. I doubt they would even look into the matter. But it's really an interesting issue because every court to look at this issue, and we're talking about people that have been kidnappers and have murdered people, you know, Henry Hill, Mafia, um, Frank Keenan kidnapped uh, Frank Sinatra as a, a kid. Um, these guys have, have prevailed when they went up and litigated this and they've won on First Amendment grounds. And so for me, because I do want to tell my story um, and I've been, you know, people have approached me, even actors like Kevin Spacey were interested in doing my story and I'm being prevented from doing it because of this assignment agreement. You mentioned the EFF uh, hasn't been helpful. How about the ACLU? A lot of people have asked. No, the that. ACLU, uh, they, they tend not to get involved in any um, criminal cases. I don't know if they would get involved in a, in a civil matter that involves me at this point in time. But uh, it's an interesting issue because mm -hmm. I could understand, you know, if you go kill somebody, you, you don't want people to write a story about it. And, you know, you don't want Jeffrey Dahmer to be able to write the Jeffrey Dahmer book if he was alive. You could understand that. But then again, you know, do you want people that advocate racism like the KKK? Do you want those people out uh, advocating their hatred? And they still can do it because why? We have the First Amendment in this country. Mm -hmm. So even how, even if people believe it's not right or it's despicable or it doesn't meet public policy, that doesn't, it really should not matter. It really goes to our, our freedom of speech. Do you see yourself as a criminal? Um, I, in, the, in the definition of the legal definition, yes, because uh, there is a law and I broke it. Okay, um, the crimes that I char were charged with, I, I don't, I, and that I pled to, I, I, I believe I committed some of them, but not, and but I didn't commit others. 
And the ones that I don't believe I'm guilty of is computer fraud and wire fraud, but I do believe I'm guilty for possessing access devices and inter intercepting electronic communications. And if you're interested in that theory, I can go into it, uh, into it. but I don't believe like in a true, uh, I mean, in, in a legal sense, yes, if you commit a crime, you're a criminal. So like if, you, if there's a law against running red lights, that you have to stop at a red light and you run through that red light, you're, I, you also broke the law. So if, if running through the light, red light is defined as a crime, you're a criminal, mm -hmm. right? So d do I believe that the, the, ty the type of criminal I am is, is analogous to a rapist, murderer, robber, terrorist? No, I think there's degrees but those were the criminality. people you were locked up with. Were yeah, those kind of people. I, be I believe there, there are degrees of criminality from mm -hmm. something that's very trivial to something that's very serious. And what the government did in my case, in the Kevin Mitnick case, is they treated me as if I was an industrial spy. I was punished based on causing millions of dollars of loss that were never caused. Um, what the government did, and it's very, it, it gets a little bit technical, but I'll be happy to explain it to you, is if you're convicted of a, of a fraud or theft-related offense, right? They have a thing called the Federal Sentencing Guidelines. It's like this grid, and you look at the person's criminal history, and you look at their offense, and you come up with a number of months they serve in prison. Well, under the sentencing guidelines, when you commit a fraud or a theft, the, the, the largest, the biggest part of your sentence is based on the loss, the loss to the victim. Well, if I steal this Red Bull can from you, you no longer have it. So your loss is, you know, a couple bucks. I've got right? my own, yes, but... Uh... You have your own, <laughs> that's good. But when the underlying property in this case was information, it was source code, because I wanted to look at the source code to spot vulnerabilities that would make me better at being able to circumvent security. Mm -hmm. when, you take, when you take a copy of that, do you deprive the owner uh, of, uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry, let me go back. How the theft and fraud guidelines work is you're punished based on the value of the property taken, damaged, or destroyed. As if you took the only copy. Right. So the value of this can of Red Bull is maybe a couple bucks. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case that I made a copy of source code so I could look at it, moved it over to USC or moved it over to university so I could examine it with the least likelihood of being detected, is the prosecutors use the theory as if in a regular tangible theft case that the that the loss to the victims were the value of the source code. So they simply wrote, a, uh, called up the victims or wrote them a letter and said, provide us a letter that, that summarizes your, the value of the source code. So all these companies provided their R&D investments. Mm -hmm. So you had Sun Microsystems saying, well, we wrote Solaris, it cost us over 80 million to develop. Nokia, with their cell phone, cost them over $131 million to develop the Nokia phone. And they're basically saying that they're, they basically turn this theory on its head, and I was punished as if I deprived these companies of their software, as if I took it and destroyed their copy. And is it not true that in the case of Solaris source code, that's now available for free? Yeah. I wonder if they could argue, you know, the prosecutors today, since they're pretty witty, they would probably say, well, the only reason Solaris went open source is because of Mitnick. He looked at it, so it was no longer a secret. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's, that's probably the position they would take, but and, and the whole idea with the, the theft and fraud, the, the, the wire fraud and computer fraud, I, was, I had to plead guilty to wire fraud and computer fraud. And to be convicted of a fraud, the Supreme Court has ruled there has to be a deprivation of money or property. And let's go back into this tangible, non-tangible thing. If I take this can from you, you no longer have it. It's tangible. I take it, you no longer have it. When it comes to information like software or source code, if I look at it, or if I make a copy of it, the question is, did, uh, did I deprive you of it? Surely I breached the confidentiality and I snooped on something that I wasn't supposed to look at. And there was one case, because I used to do all this legal research when I was in jail, this one case involving a guy named Richard Sabinski. He was an IRS agent in, uh, on the East Coast. And what he did is he used IRS computers to get people's tax return information. And he was caught. I guess because they audit. And he went to trial. He was basically charged with wire fraud and computer fraud, the same statutes that I was charged with. And he was convicted and he was sentenced to six months in prison. Hmm. Okay, a lot less than five years. And then he appealed it basically saying, using the argument, by looking at this information and by making a copy of it, I didn't deprive anybody of their, of the I didn't deprive, deprive them of this property. 
So he took it all the way up to the appellate court. So it's the first court in US history to look at the issue, what line do you have to cross before there's a deprivation of their property interest in the, in the information? And the court had ruled that the government would have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person who looked at the information would, would have, have had the intent to use it or disclose it to the detriment of the owner. And in my case, the government never alleged, or, and, they, and they fully, f and fully they were aware they didn't that, that, I wasn't, yeah, that I wasn't intending to use or disclose that information. And that's what I wanted to go to trial on. So yeah, I got in, I looked at the information, but I had no malicious intent to use it or disclose it, so hence I'm not guilty of fraud, because I didn't deprive Motorola, Nokia, Fujitsu, NEC of their property interest. Yes, I trespassed and I snooped, but it didn't amount to fraud. And the government had told my attorney, if I take them to test on their case, they're just going to move me through jurisdiction to jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So that's why I really believe that under federal law, I wasn't guilty of fraud, do but of other federal crimes. Do you no. think you would have won a trial, though, had you taken it to trial? Not in the federal district court, because this judge hated me. This judge uh, I had dealt with on my first case. She really bought into the myth of Kevin Mitnick that I could, you know, give Mitnick duct tape and a nine volt battery, and he could like cause a nuclear strike. Um, I believe I would have had a good chance in the appellate court, but this was another scary thing: is any time you go to the appellate court, you're rolling the dice. What happens is you draw three judges that you're well aware, DCSS, right? And those three judges might not necessarily agree with the three judges in the First Circuit, where Sabinsky was. And then if they disagree, then certainly what would have happened if I took it to trial and lost, this judge would have hammered me and maybe, you know, maybe given me 15 or 20 years to make, you know, make me the biggest example in the world. And then I would have been praying that these three judges agree with this other uh, federal appellate court. And if they didn't, I would have been screwed. So I didn't take the chance. I basically signed. Uh, and got out. You've learned so much about the justice system since 1988. Yeah. I mean, I became, I became what surprises like a, you the most about it? I mean, is it disillusioning to know that as well, much as you do? It's all about the, who's winning. That, that's what the game is. Mm -hmm. You have two attorneys. You have a defense attorney and prosecutor. The prosecutors have all the resources because they have unlimited budget. So it's all about money then? It's all about money. It's all about who has the money. It's all about, it's not about justice. It's about economics and it's about winning at all costs. That's what the uh, federal justice system is about. But then again, it's not been my argument. It's always been my, it hasn't been my argument that I didn't do anything wrong and I didn't deserve to be punished. My argument was what I really did was trivial in a sense. I caused some loss, nowhere near the losses the government has, has accused me of. And certainly, it certainly didn't give the federal judiciary or the federal prosecutors uh, the right to disregard my constitutional rights. I sat in prison for four long years awaiting trial. Okay, I, that, that, I'm not presumed to be an innocent man sitting in prison for four and a half years. Um, I'm the only one in US history that was held without a bail hearing. Theodore Kaczynski, Unabomber, Timothy McVeigh, um, Oklahoma City, uh, these guys, uh, Malvo and uh, Muhammad or whatever, uh, Washington DC snipers. Uh, Robert Hansen, uh, Aldrich Ames, all these guys, uh, Lee Ho Wynn or uh, Los Alamos. They didn't get bail, but they got a bail hearing. They didn't get bail, but they got the hearing. And the reason you want the hearing, why it's so valuable, is the test is, is there any condition or combination of conditions that will reasonably assure that you'll appear? That's the test. Because I was a fugitive, it would have been a hard way to go. But the reason you want the hearing is you have a right to testify, to proffer evidence, to have representation by counsel, to, to hear the government side of the case. And then what happens is you could appeal that decision of the lower court because they look at the hearing and they see it on paper in the transcripts. Well, if you never have the hearing, you also don't have the right to appeal a hearing that never occurred. And constitutionally, before the government could deprive you of your freedom, you have a right to a hearing, period. What do you think would have been a fair sentence for someone who committed the crimes that you committed. Do you think prison is even something that should be considered? Um, yeah, that's kind of you know self-serving <laughs> type of question. Um, what I really think the government should have done is really figured uh, the, or the victims uh, they should have figured out the real losses that I caused 
you know, the real dollar amount and not exaggerated and blown it all out of proportion. And then based on whatever the federal law was at that time, like whatever the punishment was for that particular number, you know, that would have been acceptable to me. I, I, I would have no complaints because, hey, I did something wrong and I got caught and that was the consequence. Um, do I think uh, do I think the laws nowadays where they're trying to put hackers away for, you know, for life? I think I think it's absolutely absurd. Well, let's fast, fast forward to the present day, yeah. post 9-11. If you had been because in a situation trying to, that, that you were in back then. Yeah, I, I, well, the, the government actually, the DOJ, if you go and go into Google or you go into LexisNexis or Westlaw, the publicity PR people in the DOJ were calling me a computer terrorist. And I've... And, they were using that derogatory term in a very loose sense, and uh, you know, and calling me, labeling me as a computer terrorist was—I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I'd never, I never, I've never crashed a computer system. I never destroyed data. I, I never uh, profited from you know, like selling stolen information or anything like that. Sorry. I never have tried to influence the government into a course of action based on some sort of threat, and yet I'm called a computer terrorist. What happens if? that happened today, I would have, I would have been on Guatemala Bay, you know, <laughs> you know, Cuba. Well, okay, by that logic, though, what damage did you cause? Because you said you did cause some damage. If you never did any of those things, where's the damage? Well, the damage is probably in them investigating the security incident. And, you know, like when you hack into a box, they don't know what your intent was, the, the, the victim, so to speak. So they probably have to reinstall the OS, change passwords, reinstall the operating system, reinstall the apps. That takes time. Time equates to money. Um, I talked to this guy named Sean Nunley, who we're friends now, but he worked at Novell. He's the guy that I called up on the telephone and was able to trick into creating me an account on their terminal server. Because I was already behind the Novell, the Novell firewall because I had a vulnerability in SMTP, but I still wanted a California dial-in. So I tracked him down at his home in Tracy, called him up, gave him a good story. He created the account. Um, what I, I did is I called his voicemail and I left the password that I wanted and he always saved the message. Then when they found out that I was the hacker, they, they sent this, uh, you know, they, they, they tape recorded the, the, the voice and they gave it to the FBI and they never heard anything for like six months. Six months later, Sean gets a call and it's Kathleen Carson in the LA office. She goes, I just played the tape and I know who it is. And he goes, what do you mean you know who it is? She goes, I don't recognize his voice right off the bat. That's Kevin Mitnick, you know, because it was, and this guy couldn't believe it. They just sat on it for six months. But so, in any event, he told me that at Novell, they were rebuilding their boxes. Like every system that I compromised, they did rebuild the box from scratch. So they were spending a lot of time and money because they didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, they didn't know whether I put in some piece of malicious code. So to cover themselves, it, you know, a, a, a co you know, spend, people are spending in a, an inordinate amount of time on it. So he said, you know, it cost them like it cost them a lot of money. He said, so that's what I'm really going on. So I'm sure I cost them some damage, but nothing, uh, nothing was intentional. I, I didn't ever profit from this, and I didn't. Um, uh, uh, crash any, you know, destroy their data. And I'm sorry for causing them the damage. Uh, that wasn't my intent. What I, what when I was doing it, what I thought that they found out about it was just a matter of changing some passwords. I had no idea mm -hmm. that they would be having to rebuild their systems. I wasn't even thinking that they'd have well, to do something like that. What motivated you in the first place? Intellectual yeah. challenge, uh, thing, so? learning how things work. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I wanted to become the best at circumventing security, right? There's two ways of doing it. You can either find security holes in closed proprietary systems by reverse engineering, which takes a lot of time. So I kind of wanted the cliff notes. Cliff notes are the source code. You look at the source code, you can look for buffer overflows, you can look for commented code where a security problem was fixed and then work it, work it backwards to go, well, they're fixing it here, so what was the vulnerability? And then I'd become very adept at being able to circumvent security, and that's all I wanted to do is to be like the best lock picker but in the sense of uh, that, and also learn how these systems worked. I like taking things apart and figuring out the inner workings of it and playing with the technology. It, to me, it was a game. It, I never meant anybody any harm by it, and it was exploratory. To me, cyberspace, beginning with the ARPANET, was all about exploring cyberspace 
and go and sneaking into things you weren't supposed to be into, kind of for the thrill of it, for the fun of it, and doing cool things and, and being a kind of a prankster and having fun with it. Wasn't that more or less accepted back in the early days? Oh yeah, like what I was doing, uh, uh, and I was doing it openly. Uh, I was, in, you know, my teachers never told me don't do it. My parents didn't tell me don't do it. It was, uh, you know, they weren't very computer knowledgeable anyway. But back then it was like, if you're a hacker, you were cool. You know, this was, you were given kudos and nobody looked at it as today as like, oh, now you're the master criminal. So I started before there were even laws against this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, a, it's a long road you've been on from the early days to, uh, to now. And I mean, you must have seen all kinds of changes, especially now that you're finally back on the internet for the first time since you were a fugitive. Um, right. What kind of changes have you noticed uh, apart from the attitude change and, and the uh, paranoia? Pop up windows. Pop up windows. Pop up windows. <laughs> and, uh, That's what it's all and, about. And spam. Uh -huh. uh, no, I think that the internet is, you know, I, when, I used, when I was busted in February 95, the internet was, um, I was using Mosaic 1.0. Uh, I, I, in the, I was browsing JPL to look at pictures of Mars. Um, pretty much, um, uh, you know, email. There was Gopher. There was Veronica. Um, there was Archie. You know, you know, back in those days, there was mm -hmm. no com there was no commercialism on the internet. In fact, I think according to the charter of NSFNet, you couldn't do any commercial transactions or profit from using the the internet and and the explosion, the dot com. The commercialization of the internet all happened when I was locked away as a presumed innocent man for four and a half years. So it must be like a totally different thing now. Seeing yeah, this. and unfortunately, I haven't had time to really sit down and, and play with it at all. But I, it's really nothing new to me, to be honest with you. I had a radio show in Los Angeles on KFI, mm -hmm. and my show was about demystifying the internet. So how what I would do is people would access the internet like, and I'd be sitting behind them, and I'd be learning about the net where I couldn't type, but where they would actually be using the internet or they'd print out stuff for me. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not like it's a big mystery, but it's nice not to have to call somebody and say, hey, check my email. To actually touch the You button. used to check my email a couple times yep. a, a while ago as a favor. Waiting through the spam to find yes. the, the one message The there. one message we're looking for, yeah. Now, you've, you've engaged in a lot of projects since your, uh, your release in 2000, um, and they all involve some kind of a challenge because obviously to do a radio show in KFI you needed to get access to what was going on in the net, you needed somebody to be able to check things for you. Um, you wrote a book uh, which, you know, considering it was about social engineering, it was about things that involved technology yet you weren't able to use the internet. Right, in fact, it was the first time I was able to use a computer was back in January of 2002. Uh, I was going to ask the probation officer for a lap, for not a laptop, but for a word processor, right? So I can work on writing the book with my co-author. Because I also have to be, what am I going to do it on a yellow pad? <laughs> so they surprised me and my probation officer gave me permission to uh, get a laptop or any, or a desktop computer as long as I do not connect to the internet. So, um, and that must have been hard because so many devices today connect to the internet by default. <laughs> so you don't even know you're connecting to the internet. Yeah, but I was, at first he wouldn't even let me get a modem. Then I convinced him, I said, listen, my co-author and I need to trade files. And the way we can only do it is by modem. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay. And I told him, and I, started, and I bought the laptop, it had a built-in modem. You know how they are, it's not like the right. old days where you had to get a modem card. Right. You know, or a PC, PC MCIA card. And these days you have built-in wireless cards. Yes. So it's, you could instantly... Actually, the laptop I had gotten uh, did, not have a, did not have a wireless card. Mm -hmm. The one I have now does. You also testified before Congress. Testified before Congress. That was fun. You were there. I was there. Yeah. And I, we, my, were, we were backstage with Joe Lieberman before he was the vice presidential candidate in 2000. Do you remember? Do you remember when he told me I should become an attorney, or was it Thompson? They were joking sure which... around. I was explaining my case, and one of them said, "You should really become a lawyer, Mr. Mitnick." That might have been Thompson, but and, I'm sure they both think along the same yeah, lines. Yeah. So then I said, "Well, there's a, a little problem with a felony conviction." I said, "Maybe you guys can help me out with a pardon." Mm -hmm. And then I was joking around with the media, and basically my first email will be to Lieberman asking him, "Hey, when he gets into office, consider a pardon." <laughs> they were so nice to you. Then. They were. They were nice guys. And, I like them. You 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 gave them all kinds of information in front of that uh, that subcommittee about security and social engineering and that kind of thing. They seemed really interested, and, and perhaps they were, but that doesn't seem to translate 
in today's legislation and the way people are being prosecuted and the overall paranoid feeling that you get in society. See, I'm, I, to, to the government, I'm still, you know, I'm still uh, hated and discriminated against, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, even recently, uh, I went to join this group called the ISSA, mm -hmm. which is the Information Security Systems Association. I think that's the name of it. And uh, uh, I went to a couple meetings and they filled in and then on the second meeting, they were, one of the guys confided in me there that actually is part of their group that they're, uh, um, they're going to try to ask me to leave, you know, uh, that I should sign up to become a member. So I signed up online the day my probation expired and they actually sent me an email granting me membership and giving me a password to the website. So now they're trying, now they're trying to manipulate the situation claiming, well, they never did enroll me. It was a mistake and the system did it, you know, automated, but it doesn't do it automated in 48 hours. I remember you running yeah. into a similar situation. Uh, so what they're trying to do, but the bottom line is here, even though I, I, made, I made a mistake, I paid my debt to society, I completed my probation, I've assisted the U.S. government and businesses, it's still people uh, in the security industry are just, of, they, they just, you know, they just won't forget, they, they just won't mm -hmm. let it be. They won't let it go. And it's a constant issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one of these guys confided me. You know, there's people here that hate you, <laughs> and you know, and, and the, you know, I'm being discriminated against. And uh, it's just, it's like an uphill battle still, because I'm dealing with these guys in suits that hacked when they were in the universities and hacked when they were in high school, but now they have to, you know, turn their image around. Like, hey. You know, I, I don't condone this type of stuff. You know, if you've done this before, you're the most, you're, you're the evilest person on earth. I mean, I look at guys like, um, well, I don't want to mention his name, one, one guy that runs uh, uh, the, the most successful information security company mm -hmm. uh, um, that started it. Okay. And it's on the stock, it's on, I believe, it's being traded. It's the I'm only sure public people one. people can find out on their own. Right. Yeah. Uh, I used to trade vulnerabilities with this guy mm -hmm. back, you know, in the uh, mid 80s, early 90s. So, and to this day, the guy doesn't hire hackers at his company, right? <laughs> See, it's all about image. It's all, it, it, to sum it up, it's all bullshit. But, well, the same thing happened to you years ago, I think a digital conference. Oh yeah, where they banned me from going to DECUS. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and what happened then? Um, basically, I signed up for the conference. My company that I was working for sent me there, and they realized I was there, and the powers to be tracked me down, and they actually booted me out from that conference. We live in a different world today with uh, the events of 9-11 and um, total information awareness, the Patriot Act. What is it that frightens you the most about all this? Well, I love a bumper sticker that I recently saw. It said um, something to the effect is, I love my country, but it's the government I'm afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of is my sentiment exactly. Um, I think in this post 9-11 world that uh, our government uh, the people in the DOJ are really exploiting this tragedy to get more power, uh, uh, you know, under the, um, you know, uh, uh, pretense that it's to fight terrorism. And they're trying to get a lot of power to surveil United States citizens with very little or no judicial review. And it, it, it's concerning to me because each and every time we as Americans in, in trying to achieve better security because of the fear of terrorism, each and every time we give up a civil liberty, we'll never get it back. And our forefathers have fought and died in wars back you know, when you know, we came from England, so to speak, uh, to fight for these rights. And it just amazes me on a day-by-day -day ba basis of how easily people are willing to give up those rights in exchange for a little bit of security. And that's what really causes me some, um, you know, some reflection. And then I think about why, when the government is asking for additional power, why don't they ask for that additional power for a very limited period of time? You know, they say, well, when the, you know, when the, you know, the fight for, you know, against terrorism is going to go on, you know, indefinitely. 
It's never going to be over. Mm -hmm. Just like the war on drugs, it's still going on today. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be over. So it really concerns me about how easily people are willing to give up these rights. Well, it's, it's because of fear, because people are fear. afraid. So security. They want security. They're willing to give up rights because they're afraid of what will happen. They're willing to give up their privacy in exchange uh, for feeling more secure. But once you give up those privacy rights, mm -hmm. you will never, ever get them back. Period. Do you see a parallel between the fear that uh, people have of, of the unknown, which makes them give up all their, all their civil liberties, and the fear that's instilled in people by the media against people like you? Yeah, uh, I, I, I do see a parallel. Um, for the reason that Kevin Mitnick became the call celeb and the cyber boogeyman was really uh, as a result of you know, John Markoff's reporting, John Johnson's reporting, and the Department of Justice. They needed a cyber boogeyman to put the fear in the hearts of the American people that there's dangerous people out there and we need to protect society against these people. And the term hacker, which I believed and still believe is an honorable term, mm -hmm. has turned to be a derogatory term. Mm -hmm. The word hacker now means a guy with a computer that's a criminal. And that's the farthest, uh, you know, that is, not the, that is not my definition. It's the furthest thing from my mind. A hacker is somebody that enjoys the intellectual challenge, likes to take things apart, likes to stretch technology and, and do things that it wasn't originally intended to do. And they like figuring their way around obstacles. One of the ways that I used to figure a way around obstacles was circumventing security. It was a challenge and it was an exploration type hobby to me. But in today's world, the world, the word, there's cracker, there's hacker, there's white hat, there's black hat. <laughs> and there's no set definition of these uh, terms. So in what are, you know, and, and, I, and I had a discussion with a Wired reporter who actually was able to, you know, they wanted to use, when they talked about Kevin Mitnick, the word cracker. And the word <laughs> cracker was a, a word that drew a strong inference that I was malicious. And malicious is intention, intentionally trying to cause harm. And I was never that type of hacker. Mm -hmm. So I made it a point to argue this fact. So now when you read stories in Wired, or, uh, on Wired Online about me, you don't see them refer to me as a cracker. Well, cracker is a fairly new term that was uh, put forth by people who wanted to defend the word hacker. Cracker used to mean code cracker. Well, what they, they didn't want software. people like Kevin Mitnick and other hackers to be in the same group as them. They, mm -hmm. they, they wanted to be distinguished because they thought that people like me brought, you know, a, a, made the word hacker a derogatory, derogatory term. I didn't do it. So it they was made the mainstream media that did it. They made a new derogatory term. Right. But it has no more definition. And that's what I think is the problem with it is that there's no definition to the word cracker and you don't know anything about what the person is. Well, it's a malicious that. hacker. Mm -hmm. But what's malicious? What, yeah, what does that mean? It's malicious by if you look at something you're not supposed to or you get into somewhere you're not mm -hmm. supposed to be or is it where you write a, a, a worm like a sequel worm that takes down the internet mm -hmm. you know what 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 is the line that you have to cross and it's not there well are defined. words there are words to describe people who do malicious things correct right you know there's other words like vandals mm -hmm. like what markov called me and labeled me in his articles was a was a computer vandal that mm -hmm. has run amok mm -hmm. you know when i never vandalized anything in my life mm -hmm. physical or electronically what do you think of the state of the hacker world today? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's like the hackers that I used to associate with or who I had knowledge of in the past have now taken their interest in exploring computer networks and circumventing security and have went to the commercial sector and are now basically hacking and getting paid for it, finding security vulnerabilities, doing security assessments mm -hmm. and uh, using their skills in a very narrow area of penetration testing. Um, and I see a lot of people that I knew about in those days doing that type of work because it's obviously too risky and now hacking, like I think of the 1960s where smoking pot was cool in the hippie era and now like they, then they have that war on drugs where if you, if you get caught with pot in, like in the state of Nevada, you're going to prison for a long time. Here it's a you know, ticket in California. But same thing in the hacking thing. In, in the beginning, when I started in the late 70s, it was a cool thing. It was a, a harmless uh, exploration. It was, you, you were kind of a snoop, getting in where you weren't supposed to be, but it wasn't that much of a big deal. In today's world, it's like they equate a hacker to a terrorist. Mm -hmm. They and, do. 
But they despite do. the despite mainstream, today's pot smokers still think that's cool. Today's hackers still think hacking is cool. Yeah, there's a, well, I, yeah, I, I believe they do. It's kind of interesting because there's a lot of hip, uh, hypocrisy. Uh, when I went to the RSA Security Conference last year, and Ira Winkler, uh, who I dislike, was making a <laughs> was making a uh, was doing a talk, and he brought me up as the example. So I stood up. I said, "Hey, don't talk about me." You know, did he know you were in no, the audience? <laughs> no, he didn't know I was there, right? So I must have shocked him a little bit. And so then he tried to engage me to comment, and I didn't want anything to do with him. He wrote a book, and his first chapter was just dissing me when I never even spoke to, spoke to the man. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't like anyone that makes uh, makes judgment calls with just you know one side of the story, mm -hmm. right? So, so Winkler. Um, I forgot what the point I was going to make now. Well, we're uh, talking about the hacker world. Oh yeah, general. so. So after that, after this thing with Winkler happened, I had a lot of people that didn't even know I was there. Now they, they knew what I looked like. Mm -hmm. You know, it got a lot of attention. And they came up to me and a lot of them said, hey man, we're, we're really sorry, you got, you got shafted. You were railroaded. You know, because to tell you the truth, I used to, you know, when I was in the university, when I was in college, I used to hack too. And these are guys coming up to me that have badges that they're with big, you know, you know security organizations like Red Siren and ISS <laughs> and, um, and these recognized security firms, and these are the guys that would uh, decree hacking. You know, if you're a hacker, you're a bad guy. You know, and they used to do it themselves. Uh, a, a, a great number of them used to be involved. You know, in the in the younger years, as dabbling in a little bit of unauthorized activity. And they remember those years. And they remember those years. Of course, they would. They, the people that told me this, and they were uh, uh, numerous of them, mm -hmm. they never told me in front of anybody else. Of course. Yeah, know, they went up to me privately. Yeah. They, they're, they're afraid of being yeah. labeled, outed as Just a like a lot of these firms, like At Stake, ISS, um, they, you know, these are the guys, you know, uh, that I've heard have engaged in a little bit of questionable activity, right? <laughs> have crossed the line themselves, yet, oh, we'd never hire a hacker, you know, like with the mark, uh, with the fiber optic thing. Mm -hmm. I thought it was ridiculous. It's, a, it's all about image. It's all, what, you know. what kind of a message would you send to today's hackers, the, the kids that are just starting out, that are curious, that see you as kind of a role model? Well, I don't want them to end up in my, foot, in, in my shoes and go through the trial and tribulations. And also, back in my day, it was the cool thing to do. In today's world, they, it's really looked at as a violation of another person's property rights. So, you know, by hacking into systems that aren't yours. So, in today's world, you can set up your own network at home. You can set up a network with a group of people and try to hack into each other's systems and not go into like corporations or where you're not supposed to be. Otherwise, you might end up as the new example. You don't want to be the new example. But they've, they've moved the line a bit. They've made it so that if you even try and reverse engineer a program, you're breaking a law now. You can go to prison for that. Oh, the DMCA. Vi violating the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It's ridiculous. So it's uh, not the just, DMCA it's not just is hacking into someone else's We can go on computer. for that for an hour. The Option. DMCA is ridiculous. Yeah. But it's all they, about money. Money you, gets you the can, lobbying You power. can yeah. commit a crime on your own computer without connecting to anything just by figuring well, out well, another computer Well, if you do so, don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say? I mean, do I think it's wrong to find vulnerabilities in security mechanisms that protect copyrighted materials? No. Mm -hmm. You know, do I think the law is bullshit? Yes. Would I openly violate that law? No. Would I encourage anybody to violate it? No. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, um, is it illegal to listen to cellular phone calls on, on scanners? Yes. Do people do it all the time? Yes. You know, do people do it in the presence of uh, the, uh, the FBI? No. You know. How would you fight the ridiculous laws? Not you personally, but how, in general, should the hacker community, should the population at well, large the is, fight these things? It's very difficult to fight because it takes money. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people, the RIAA, the MPAA, they have a lot of money backing them. The, the, people, uh, the, the people that are interested in defeating security for the intellectual challenge do not have a lot of money. And uh, they're more of the, uh, you know, of the uh, everyday wage earner, mm -hmm. okay? But at least back in, you know, my day. So it's who has the most money is going to win. 
you know, who's going to have the money to influence congressmen and congressmen and women and senators? Well, it's the obviously, people with the money. we're never going to have as much money as as the opposition. But should we give up because of that? No, I, I don't believe in giving up. You should get the word out mm -hmm. to to the population about the pros and cons and and influence people to make up their own mind based on the uh, based on the arguments. That's one thing that I think uh, we can look to the Free Kevin movement as getting the word out. Yeah, yeah. That's I, I thought true. it was amazing how the word spread, how everybody was saying Free Kevin. And I think that kind of um, um, added to future movements such as the Free Dimitri movement and various Yeah, I things. actually picketed for Dimitri mm -hmm. down here in Santa Monica. It's funny, my girlfriend and I were in Las Vegas and on her uh, Jeep, on her Jeep Cherokee, she has a Free Kevin bumper sticker. And we're driving in Vegas. This is about a week or two ago. and. Uh, and then someone shouts out, he's already free, you know, out of the car. <laughs> you know, it's kind of cool because you never figure that people are really going to know. Yeah. Because a lot of people stop my grandma, they go, who's Kevin? Mm -hmm. You know. And, and, and so many people do know. So many people have found out people you wouldn't expect, you know, right. gas station attendants and, you know, people's father-in-law. No, and I owe a lot of gratitude, you know, to you personally and to the members of 2600 for getting the word out. Because if the word, if, if people didn't... Um, speak their mind to their opinion of what was happening to me and about my civil rights being disregarded, about the media and about the federal prosecutors, you know, creating a character of Kevin Mitnick of, you know, something that I never really could do, mm -hmm. like break into NORAD or, you know, start a nuclear war is, you know, they would have basically been able to pull the wool over everybody's eyes. And who knows, I might not even be here today talking to you. I might be, have been the computer terrorist or Merrimax when they were making that atrocious movie that was going to cast me in this light as, uh, as the Hannibal Lecter of computers, mm -hmm. when it was simply a fabricated script loosely based on Markov's writings. And here we and, are five years later, that film still has not seen the light of day in this country. It's, no. out, it's out in Europe, but it's, I don't think it's ever going and to be And I get email here. all the time saying, I love the film, you were, you were great. <laughs> In, in are you sure of, they're not talking about this film? No, they're talking about Takedown, oh. right? They're talking about Takedown, and it's, it's not true. It's not the true story. Uh -huh. and, and, and they're like, they're, they're now a fan because they saw this, this movie that doesn't depict the real Kevin Mitnick. Do you, get, do you get any mail about Freedom Downtime? No. No? No, it's all about, they call it <laughs> Cybertrack or take, but don't forget, I haven't been using email for oh, that long. Oh, that's true, that's true. You know, what's the date, the 25th? So we're talking about four whole days? Yeah. yeah. But what did you think of Freedom Downtime? Oh, I thought it was great. Yeah. Anything, uh, anything that we got wrong, anything that needs to be expanded upon? Well, no, I think it's always good to get information. I thought it could have been just a tad bit shorter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and like, for instance, like you had a scene in there where you're removing gum out of the car. That was an important scene. You know, I'm wondering, you know, wow. That, that, that's that a very gum, valuable scene. That it was funny. It was it funny. It symbolized but. the difficulty that we were having telling the story because it stuck to the surface of the car and it was just a mess. Maybe I just didn't get it, but um, um, I, I thought it was very well done and it's the best, uh, it's the best uh, film that uh, really um, goes out into the community and really discusses the, the, good, the important issues. And see, what I think the Free Coven movement is about, it's not just about me, it's about we don't want this to happen again. We don't want the government or business to use their powers to, make a, to unfairly make an example out of somebody for something they did not do because they're trying to advance their own agenda. John Markoff was trying to advance the agenda of writing the Kevin Mitnick book so he can profit, which he did, and he made multi-million dollars. Uh, the government agenda was trying to get more power uh, and more laws passed that the DOJ could enforce. enforce. The prosecutor's agenda in their overzealousness in my prosecution was to advance in their own careers. In fact, right after I pled guilty, Christopher Painter went on to be the deputy chief of CSIPS, mm -hmm. the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section, and David Schindler went into private practice right after the Kevin Mitnick case was done because they wanted to advance in their own careers. The FBI wanted to basically send a message, if you make fools out of us, we're going to get you. One thing a lot of people ask about uh, with regards to the film Freedom Downtime mm -hmm is what was going on inside the prison when we were filming you from the mobile station across the street. Now, you've told me this story of what was actually happening inside while you were banging on the window. Well, at first, uh, the guards the, uh, you know, didn't know anything. But out the window, I can see you guys. And, 
and there was um, a, a can of like hair gel, like you know, like a like a little tub can, and to signal you so you know what window I'm at because I know it's very difficult to see up from there. I, I'd bang on the little tiny window. The window was yay big, like it was a slit yeah. of glass. You can't even. It was about this the size of this. Yeah. And it, you know, it's really not comfortable to look out or look in. So I was banging on the uh, on the thing to get your attention and. It did. Uh, and I was surprised that you could actually hear it so loudly because when I saw Freedom Downtime, I could hear it, you know, which was amazing. Yeah. And eventually, what happened is uh, the the uh, prison guards or the or the staff realized that the, you know there was somebody across the street with a camera filming up at the prison. So then they figured out somehow that it had something to do with me. So as I was signaling to you and waving. And then I just had an intuition at a certain time to go down to where the guard was and just chat with him, you know, and that way he sees him right there. So I couldn't have been anywhere else. So coincidentally, within 30 seconds, of, you know, within about five minutes of chatting, he gets a phone call and he's talking, he goes, no, he's right here in front of me. <laughs> so somebody called asking where I was, mm -hmm. assuming I was at the window. and. Uh, and then all of a sudden, there's like a, a, like the goon squad came, all these guards, and they locked everybody down in their rooms. Uh, but they didn't do it. They asked me about, do you know who's across the street? Do you know what's going on? I go, no. You know, I just acted completely stupid. And, uh, and uh, that's what I recall. So how many people were in this prison at the time? Well, I was on a floor with about 130 other Inmates. Was it the entire prison that got no. locked down? Just the floor? I, from what I know, it was the just the entire floor. Uh -huh. How do they know what floor to lock down? I just... guess what they I guess what they saw is um, I don't know. They knew because if you guys had free Kevin banners. They knew it was probably the floor that I was on that you guys were protesting or something, and they get very paranoid when somebody's outside filming filming the prison. Yeah, we and it's great you guys were across the street because when they told you to go away, you just basically go, say, go fly a kite. Well, no, what they did was they told us to, to come over to them. You yeah, know, right. They were standing on their sidewalk. Said, come over here. We just want to talk to you for a second. He said, come over here. <laughs> I said, no way. We're not going over there. So we stayed by the mobile Yeah, because there's nothing they can do yeah, when you're on public property. And we weren't the only people there. Other people were coming and waving at, at their relatives or whatever. And uh, it's the only place you can visit for many. Yeah, people. then what's happened is somebody actually, the, the, uh, someone actually took a free Kevin bumper sticker mm -hmm. and stuck it on the glass at the Metropolitan Detention, Detention Center. It wasn't us. We didn't do that. Right. So if you get this, <laughs> so these morons come up to me and barge in in the room I was in and they go, how did this sticker get up on the window? And like <laughs> I had, like I knew, like, oh, yeah, well, I, I snuck out of the prison and put it up and came back. And uh, I go, I don't know. And they, you know, it, you know, I just played dumb and they basically went about their business, but they, I mean, what's the intelligence of these guys that come up to me and ask how, how did I do it? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like I broke out, then I decided to put a sticker on and come back up? How were you treated for the most part in prison, both by the, the, the guards and the fellow prisoners? Well, in, when I was in detention in MDC, I was, I was tr treated re reasonably well by, you know, the prison guards there. They were just doing their job. Um, uh, you know, some of them decided they, you know, had you know, personal issues and would be very petty. But the prisoners, um, I, 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 I had a lot of respect because of my intelligence and for what I was in there for and because of my notoriety. But at the same time, there was a lot of disrespect because I didn't do it for the money. Hmm. Because they said if I, they had my skills, they would have been using that to, you know, uh, to get fat bank accounts. That's what the, their terminology was. They'd be, they'd be, they'd be, they'd have big bank. That's their lingo in there. And, uh, they would have used the skills that I had to steal as much money as potentially possible and go, you know, live in Tahiti. So from both sides, you lose. People yes. either think that you're doing something of a terroristic nature and you should be locked up for the maximum amount of time, or they don't respect you because you didn't. Now imagine if I wanted to really hurt this country when I was in prison to teach these guys the skills and to give them the tools, especially in today's world where hacker tools are, you know, just simply going to the right website. People to who you ordinarily would never associate yeah, with. Right, ordinarily would never associate with if I had wanted to, which I'd never had done, I could have given them the, the intelligence and the know-how and they could have used those skills and they certainly would have been ripping off everybody left and right. Do you really think you could have taught people in, in that prison to hack on this on a level that you are I could have given them, yeah, there's a lot of intelligent people there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, not, I don't say at the same level, but at least uh, where they can start 
uh, in how uh, the vulnerabilities that are out there in some of the systems. I certainly could have given them information, but I never had a desire to. Did they ever pressure you to do this? Well, I was approached by a Colombian drug lord that offered me $5 million cash, no questions asked, if I could somehow get him released once I was released from custody. And uh, I had a Nigerian uh, guy who was part of a Nigerian credit card fraud uh, ring that said, if I were to give him 100,000 credit cards, he'd give me a million dollars cash. Of course, I would never, see, I never, my, my motive and purpose between, uh, behind hacking was never to steal. And I consider that like outright theft. And that wasn't what Kevin Mitnick was about. So, of course, I never took any of these guys up on their offers. Throughout this whole ordeal, uh, a lot of us have been impressed by the support from your family. Yes, and my the, grandmother, my mom. It's, it's simply incredible. And I, I think we, we should spend a moment just acknowledging that. And um, also, uh, I'm wondering how much strength did you actually gain from your relatives on the outside? Who were oh, a tremendous amount, my, uh, my, especially from my mother and grandmother. They were always there behind me. They were very supportive. They'd come up to visit me and make a, they would drive from Las Vegas to Los Angeles like every you know, three weeks and uh, they went through an extreme hardship. Uh, not only did I go through an, you know, a painful experience, but it was very painful uh, for, my, for my mother and grandmother. And my dad also, it affected him and he passed away uh, from lung cancer in July of uh, 2001. And I really missed out on the years that I could have spent you know, you know, with family like my father. And then as soon as I get out, you know, the, these, this medical situation uh, happened and then he passed away and I lost all that time with him, you know, so that was a significant, you know, emotional event in my life that, uh, that you know, I, there's nothing I can do, you know, mm -hmm. it, it happened and um, if I wasn't, you know, sent away for five years, at least I could have spent more time with my father. And then a the time before that when you were on the run and weren't able to spend time with Yes, them. for with anybody. And that was the reason I went on the run was because I was afraid. They are afraid that the government would have hyped me up to be somebody that I really wasn't and punish me uh, and, uh, like they did before, and I was just scared. Mm -hmm. you know. So what do you have planned for the future? Well, I wrote this uh, book, Art of Deception, which is doing really well. It's all about social engineering, how it's done, and it's kind of like a security awareness training tool so people uh, and companies could use this and read and learn about the techniques so they won't be, so they'll be able to recognize, to prevent, detect, and respond to these types of threats. And then um, I just started uh, defensive thinking with my colleague Alex Casper. And uh, we're doing kind of like what I mentioned earlier, what do you see hackers doing nowadays? Taking their skills and working for the commercial sector. So we're looking at doing security awareness training, vulnerabilities, security assessments, pen testing, and wireless security. So I'm basically taking my knowledge with the uh, with you know, technical knowledge and you know, people-based knowledge and applying it to help businesses protect themselves against the threats. Well, best of luck with that. <laughs> thank you. And thanks for all the inspiration. We're sorry well, we I went mean, through. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, I mean it's, it's, a, it's hard to believe this whole thing is over. Yeah. I mean, we're sitting here today. I remember you know, I, I could reflect back to the time I was arrested on February 15th, 2000. No. Yeah, was it, what was it, 15, uh, no, February 15, 1995, my God, yeah. at 1.30 in the morning. And here, it's what, uh, you have my watch. <laughs> it's uh, January 24th, 25th and of 2003. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long, you know, almost eight years of uh, dealing with this, which is, uh, um, and originally the government wanted to give me a sentence minimum of eight years. Mm -hmm. They were trying to put me away for a very long time, claiming that I actually, the, the pro federal prosecutors in the case actually wanted me to go through a CIA debriefing when I was arrested in North Carolina under the guise that I infiltrated U.S. government secrets. It's the same thing with Kevin Polson's case. They accused him of uh, having national security information. What they had done is he worked for SRI International. He backed up his uh, computer, put it on the mag tape, stored it in the locker, so when they found him, there was some information there that they classified after they found it on him. <laughs> You know, they play dirty pool. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a very scary thing. You never want to be, the government is like, it's, it's a machine that never stops, that has unlimited money. And if you ever become a target 
of the federal government, God help you unless you have a lot of money to fight them. I think those are almost exactly the same words Bernie S. said in our film. <laughs> and it's amazing to hear that uh, you've both been through such similar situations and you both have the same perspective. And I imagine many, many people also have that perspective who have been through the ringer. And I, I'm, I'm really dreading the amount of people that will go through this in the future. And I hope that uh, we can all be together to fight this and to, um, uh, to kind of be a unified front, maybe a resource for people to, um, to come to should bad things happen. Because yeah, like I, I, I would be there for the next guy and try to help in any way I can. In fact, Omar Figueroa, who's a lawyer, uh, actually represented me pro bono when the state was going to try to prosecute me after the federal government had finished, if you recall that. Yes. And uh, he actually called me and said, hey, would you be an expert witness? in this case uh, that I'm defending and I said sure you know I'd do it pro bono because I I don't want somebody else to be subject just subjected to the hype and hyperbole and uh, mistreatment that I had undergone um, at the hands of overzealous uh, government officials so we're all going to be there we're all going to keep trying to uh, to fight this thing and keep people updated in the future yes great all right. and I want to thank you hey it's Thanks. been a pleasure all right, all right. best of luck all right. Congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations, Kevin. Say congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations, Kevin. Welcome back to the internet. I have a porn site. See me there. Congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations, Kevin. I'll be hiding these now. Congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations, Kevin. Hey Kevin, congratulations from your friends and family in Wisconsin. Congratulations Kevin. Hey congratulations Kevin! Congratulations Kevin, it's been two days. So uh, we're waiting. Congratulations. Is congratula con Does it have a T or a D congratulations? It sounds like congrat. People say congrat, but you say congratulations like a D. It doesn't always sound like a D congratulations, it's a G even. How do you say it? Say it. Congratulations. G is a G. Congratulations. It's a G. It's not a T or a D. It's a G. C O N G. Adulations. <laughs> Whatever it felt. Congratulations, Kevin. Fuck it, A. Congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations, Kevin. Sorry, Kevin. I wasted your time and uh, everyone else's who's watched this with a lot of nonsense. But you know, we're all pretty happy that you're uh, you're not just out, but now you're sort of free to uh, roam and play like all of us have for, uh, well, since you've been in jail, pretty much. So welcome to the club, it's great to have you. Um, continued success and uh, more of that kind of stuff. Congratulations, Kevin, good job. Kevin, dear, the world is yours. The day has finally come. Congratulations, honey. Congratulations, Kevin, welcome back. May the force be with you. Congratulations, Kevin. Yeah, you know, that, that's good. What she just did, we get everybody to say, Congratulations, Kevin. It's sort of a collage at the end. Congratulations, Kevin. We see Wozniak, President Bush, the Pope, and like, and the end. We just go out. On, and this is good to include for the DVD blooper that we're actually thinking of this right now. At the very end, we just end with congratulations, Kevin, on the screen. Fade to black. Huh? <laughs> Who knows how to make a film?